Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. Today we're starting a brand new section, section 5, if, I, if my math is right. And that will take us to an area of the world we have not visited yet, Sub-Saharan Africa. The term Sub-Saharan simply means the area below the Sahara Desert, so basically Central and Southern Africa, or Black Africa if you prefer. In previous sections, we studied the Egyptians, the Carthaginians, the Vandals, the Arabs, all of whom lived in Northern Africa. So it's time to broaden our scope and uh, head further south. And I mean broaden our scope. Africa is a huge continent. So when I speak of African society in general terms, take it with a grain of salt. There were a lot of regional variations and I'm painting with a broad stroke here. Also, I don't consider myself an expert on pre-colonial Africa. Saying the World History Survey is only designed to kind of whet your appetite. So if you're interested in a more granular approach, read a book or take an upper level college course with an actual specialist in the field. In my World History courses, I like to organize each section around the theme. For this section, it will be slavery. Not just the Atlantic slave trade to the Americas, which we'll study when we get to the Kingdom of the Congo, but also the export trade to the Muslim world, which we'll study when we get to the Kingdom of Mali, and also the internal slave trade, Africans enslaved by fellow Africans, which we'll study today, after I make a few general points about pre-colonial African societies. So, three lectures in all. Let's start by exploring the geography of Africa, which is relevant to our story today. As mentioned earlier, Africa is a vast continent with many variations, but there are some general trends. Africa uh, straddles the equator, so seasons more, become more extreme as you move away from the equator, uh, i.e. temperatures are the same year-round around the equator, uh, but then you get some real winter and summer variation when you move deep into the northern uh, and the southern hemispheres. Rainfall also varies a lot. Generally, there's a lot of rain near the equator and less so as you get further south and north. Those variations in seasonal temperatures and rainfall, along with regional features like rivers and mountains, uh, they lead to multiple climate zones arranged roughly in a north-south gradient as you move away from the equator. Right along the equator, a country like Centrafrique today, the climate is similar to the Amazon, a rainforest with high temperature and humidity year-round. A bit further out, tempers, temperatures remain warm, but there's a dry and a rainy season. Uh, so rain is less abundant overall and trees become more scarce. This is a classic savanna landscape that you see on pictures of Tanzania, for example. Further out again, rain becomes even less reliable, so trees are rare to non-existent. Even grass becomes patchy. Uh, this semi-arid landscape is called the steppe. And there's a long strip of that on the southern side of the Sahara Desert called the Sahel region. Uh, that area tends to be subject to long droughts. So when you hear about the Sahel news, sadly, that's usually because the rains have failed for some reason and uh, for several years, and famine is an issue. Continuing our journey away from the equator, we get to an even drier region, either the Kalahari and Namib deserts in the south or the Sahara desert in the north. Extremely dry, obviously, aside from the occasional oasis. Still warm overall, though temperatures can get pretty chilly at night. Things change dramatically as you reach the extreme north and south of Africa. The climate zone there is called Mediterranean, uh, similar to what you'd find in Italy or Greece or southern California. Fairly dry overall, uh, but there's enough rainfall in the fall and the winter to grow crops like olive trees or grapes. And as a result, South Africa makes some great wines. And North Africa could too, but they typically don't since Islam has a ban on alcohol. Uh, those regions are fine enough in the equator that winters can be fairly cool, especially at high elevations like the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, where you do get snow. And I heard there's even a ski resort in Lesotho in southern Africa. Overall, notice that many of these climate areas are not congenial to human settlement. Uh, the steppe and the desert regions are much too dry. Uh, the equatorial rainforest has plenty of rainfall, but it's also home to many pests like mosquitoes and the tsetse fly, which transmit yellow fever, malaria, and sleeping sickness. Uh, parasites are common too, so even draft animals like cows and horses don't fare well. Elsewhere in Africa, rains tend to be fickle and soils are often poor. As a result, there are only a few spots where intensive human settlement is even possible. 
uh, the transitional region of the Sanana, especially alongside big rivers like the Congo and the Niger rivers. Uh, the region around the Great Lakes in Central East Africa, where there are volcanoes and rich soils like the country of Rwanda today. And the Mediterranean regions of the extreme south and north, like South Africa, on the coast of Algeria, and the banks of the Nile River, uh, due to the reasons outlined when we study Egypt in section one. Aside from that, between the lack of rain, the bad soils, and the prevalence of pests, parasites, and disease, uh, most of Africa traditionally had a low density of population, at least until the 1950s. Nowadays, uh, vaccines and better farming techniques have led to a population boom in some areas. This low population density may surprise you, since Africa has been settled for so long. Remember from section 1 that Africa is the cradle of humankind. The first hominids appeared millions of years ago in what is today Ethiopia, Africa. Same thing with Homo sapiens, our direct ancestors. So Africa should have a large population since humans originated there, and they had plenty of time to multiply. Uh, but instead, human populations boomed in places settled at a much later stage, like India, Europe, or China, uh, where the climate was more friendly. From that original human settlement in East Africa, a vast diversity of people emerged over time, and these are often referred to as tribes or ethnic groups. Uh, such ethnic groups can be defined by racial characteristics, but mostly by culture. Uh, an ethnic group might share the same gods or the same language, for example. The largest of these ethnic groups in sub-Saharan Africa are the Bantu people, B-A-N-T-U. Uh, they mastered agriculture, animal husbandry, and blacksmiths before anybody else did in the region, and that gave them an edge over their hunter-gatherer neighbors. And so from their homeland around what is today Cameroon, uh, the Bantu spread out to places like Central and Southern Africa, uh, where the various Bantu groups are now dominant. And that event is called the Great Bantu Migration. Those migrating Bantu groups pushed out earlier groups, uh, but they did not replace them altogether, especially in the less desirable spots. So you can still encounter much more ancient pygmy populations in the equatorial forests of Central Africa, as well as the Khoisan people in the Kalahari Desert of Southern Africa. Uh, the Khoisan, well, sometimes referred to as the Bushmen, uh, they have a unique clicking language, which you may have heard if you watch the old 80s comedy, The Gods Must Be Crazy, which is a bit dismissive toward the Khoisan. So Central and Western Africa uh, has a mix of ancient populations like the Khoisan and the Pygmies, and more recent migrants like the Bantu. The northern part of Africa would be home to descendants of the various people we've studied in the class so far, Jews, Berbers, Arabs, Turks, so if you add up all of that, an incredible level of ethnic diversity, which you can measure by, again, looking at languages. Uh, the map you see here depicts the various language families of Africa. The Bantu languages are in green, for example. That map is extremely complex as it is, but the colors just correspond to basic language families. If you zoom in, you'll notice that the Bantu family is further divided into dozens of independent languages and dialects. Compare that to the present day US, where you have a very large country where one language, English, is dominant everywhere, with just a few pockets of Spanish and French speakers here and there. So Africa features an incredible level of racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity. And that diversity proceeded for so long in part because due to the very low population density, and you're gonna hear that word a lot today, it was possible for ethnic groups like the Khoisan to preserve their unique culture for centuries because, until recently, they had limited contact with the rest of the world. If you've paid close attention, you may have noticed that two of the kingdoms that we'll study later in the section, the Congo and Mali, are located in the intermediate savanna region alongside major rivers, i.e. some of the few places where there were enough people to support a powerful kingdom. So more favorable living conditions usually translate into denser populations and then more advanced kingdoms. Very similar to what we studied in ancient times where the most advanced civilizations typically merge alongside the densely populated banks of major rivers like the Tigris and the Euphrates. Another semi-temperate area with good access to water is modern day Zimbabwe, located between the Zambezi and Limpopo rivers in South East Africa. That region was once home to a thriving kingdom known as Zimbabwe, and technically the term Zimbabwe only refers to the fortified settlement where political power was concentrated, and especially the capital of Great Zimbabwe. Uh, but in practice, the term is used both for the court, the palace, and 
the whole kingdom in general. As you can see from all these pictures, the site of Great Zimbabwe consisted in a large uh, circular fortress with multiple layers of walls and then some statues of a large fish eagle. And that bird has remained a symbol of Zimbabwe to the present time. You'll see it on the flag of the modern-day country of Zimbabwe. Notice how this impressive stone fortress goes against the usual Hollywood stereotype of Africa as a jungle with huts like in the old Tarzan movies. Well, the more densely populated areas of Africa could be home to sophisticated cultures like Zimbabwe or Ethiopians. They also built beautiful Christian churches, for example. And that can be hard to fathom for people who have racial prejudices against black Africans. Uh, when European colonizers first encountered the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, for example, they refused to accept that black Africans could have built such a beautiful fortress. Uh, so archaeologists came up with all sorts of spurious theories claiming that King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, you know, from the Bible, uh, they had built a fort of Zimbabwe, which is false, just to be clear. So we've already seen two consequences of Africa's traditionally low population density great cultural diversity, and the fact that centralized kingdoms only arose where the landscape could sustain enough people. The low population density also shaped the religious landscape of Africa. I'm not talking here about Christianity and Islam, which have many followers in Africa today, uh, but are imported religions. I'm talking about religions native to Africa. And these are usually grouped under the umbrella term of local religions, or traditional religions, or animism. One frequent trope in African animist religions is the bush, uh, the wild area that begins beyond the village and extends until the next human settlement. Uh, because population density was often low, the bush was vast, generally devoid of human presence, and viewed as dangerous and mysterious. The bush would be the realm of the wild animals, as well as gods and spirits. So bringing an item from the bush into the village was considered a bad omen or burying a deceased family member inside the bush was a form of punishment. Uh, the few humans who dared to venture into the bush, uh, the hunters, they would often double up as magical figures with supernatural powers in African folklore. We'll see that when we get to Mali. It's also worth noting that among the various deities worshipped by African animists, fertility goddesses featured prominently. There's a great tradition of wood carving in sub-Saharan Africa, including carvings of pregnant women with large hips and breasts. And clearly those fertility goddesses were worshipped because the population was small, so it was important to have children to settle the land. A little side note to my Louisiana students. If you ever make it to Houston, please visit the Menil Collection. It's a free museum and it has a magnificent collection of African art, including statues of those fertility goddesses I just mentioned. Really great museum. I highly recommend it. But back to Africa. Uh, the most famous of the animist religions of Africa is Vodun, which is prevalent in West African countries like Benin, as well as countries where African captives were transported by the Atlantic uh, slave trade, like Haiti and, right here, Louisiana. You may also know it as voodoo in English. Vodun is polytheistic. Uh, various deities are worshipped, such as Dembala, which takes the form of a snake. And a snake might sound scary to you, but Dembala is a good god associated with agriculture. Because the climate of Africa was so unforgiving, the purpose of Vodun was more pragmatic than spiritual, to communicate with the gods so that you could ask for their help, whether it's a good crop or rain or a successful pregnancy, anything that would boost the population. To communicate with the gods required some special chants, mysterious symbols, as well as sacrifices like goats or chickens. Only then would the gods appear often by possessing the faithful, and then the gods would grant their wishes. Uh, people able to communicate with the world of gods would have special stature in pre-colonial Africa. You may call those people oracles, uh, people who can interpret omens and thus predict the future, or witches, people who can use the gods to perform supernatural acts. Animism, in that sense, it's quite similar to what we studied in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, where the religion was also polytheistic and pragmatic and where oracles and witches also featured prominently. Once African ancestors also belonged to the magical world of the gods. Instead of disappearing altogether or heading off to some distant heaven, uh, the African dead would hang around the village of their descendants. Uh, in fact, uh, the dead were often buried inside the village or even right underneath the family hut. 
think of his ancestors as ghosts in a way. So I'm not sure if they would come and do some sexy pottery with you. As I said earlier, African animist religions tended to be pragmatic. Uh, they were a way to tackle an unforgiving environment, disease, child mortality, and the lack of rain. For that reason, Africans were always willing to adopt other gods if they worked. They were not religious zealots. Uh, this is the reason why Africans were eventually willing to embrace Christianity and Islam when they came on the scene. Though not exclusively. Uh, Christianity and Islam are supposed to be monotheistic, uh, but in practice many African converts would still worship the traditional gods as well as Allah or merge Catholic saints and animist gods, as is the case of Haitian voodoo. That practice is called syncretism, mixing two religions into a new one. So low population density influenced religious practices, especially the cult of deities associated with fertility and agriculture, as well as the pragmatic African approach to religion. But low population density also had a political impact. Outside of areas with fairly large populations like Zimbabwe, Mali, the Congo, centralized empires were few because there simply weren't enough people around. So a place like modern-day Nigeria would be home to dozens or even hundreds of independent local political entities. A single village or province that was home to a few hundred or a few thousand people, and they could rule themselves as an independent polity. A little side note, I specialize in the history of slavery in the Caribbean, and when doing my research, I was always struck by how many slaves in the Caribbean claimed to have been kings in Africa. Initially, I just discounted those stories as inventions, that slaves were probably inventing some glorious past to regain some dignity as slaves. But in reality, many of them may have been kings for real, just kings of tiny independent kingdoms in Nigeria, of which there were a lot, because again, wherever population density was low, it was difficult to build a large centralized empire. Those small independent kingdoms typically encompassed members of the same extended family, since there were only so many potential marriage partners in the given village, so you could describe those as kinship groups, a political system based on family ties. Traditional African societies, they tended to be patriarchal, meaning men were in charge, and also geriatric, i.e. old men were in charge. And I guess we can't be too critical. I'm tipping this in uh, late October 2020, and an old dude named Joe Biden is challenging another old dude named Donald Trump to become president. Well, another old dude, Mitch McConnell, uh, rules in the Senate. At least the House is led by an old woman, Nancy Pelosi. In contrast with our political system, where we elect just one person for each post, African kinship polities were often led by a council of elders who ruled communally as a group. So consensus would be key, and decisions were reached through endless conversations. Even when there was an actual king, he could not be too autocratic, otherwise his subjects would simply flee. Remember that there was plenty of room everywhere. One local proverb in Africa compared political power to an egg. When you have an egg in your hand, you should not hold it too tight, otherwise you'll just crush the egg. Same thing with power. Another African proverb said, you cannot sit alone and be a chief, i.e. don't scare away all your subjects, otherwise you'll find yourself alone as a king of nobody. Very different from the political system that we've studied in densely settled areas of the world like Egypt, where political power tended to be much more centralized and authoritarian because, well, you could not just leave the banks of the Nile River and relocate to the middle of the desert, so you had to obey the pharaoh. The communal nature of African kinship policy required a lot of talking before reaching a consensus. And that deeply annoyed the Portuguese merchants when they first reached West Africa in the 1400s. Those merchants wanted to meet the local boss in Africa so that they could get a quick answer on whether they could, I don't know, buy slaves in the area, for example. And instead, those Portuguese merchants would be treated to days and days of negotiations with local elders. And so the Portuguese would roll their eyes and say, palavra, palavra, which means so many words. And that expression has entered our English language, a palaver from the Portuguese palavra. That is a kind of endless negotiation, and that term goes back to a West African political practice. A palaver is a kind of consensus building that went on inside the Council of Elders. I love it when etymology meets history. 
A little digression, my parents had a chance to visit Mali in the 1990s and they told me how in one village that they visited, the palaver hut was extremely low to the ground. The roof was maybe five feet up the ground, which seemed impractical because well, all the elders had to squat when they met to discuss politics. But the elders told my parents that the strange architecture was by design. The elders had noticed how when people get into a heated argument, they tend to stand up to yell in each other's face. So the elders kept the roof low. This way, whenever someone got mad and stood up, he would bang his head on a beam, get a bim bump, and fall back to the ground. I think that's a genius idea, especially since, again, as of October of 2020, political passions are at a fever pitch in the US due to the upcoming election. Maybe we should chop up the rotunda of Congress and rebuild it just five feet of the ground. Just a thought. Social relationships in Africa were also influenced by the low population density. In countries where there are too many people, life is cheap and kids are not valued as much as they should. A place like China practiced female infanticide until very recently. And I mean very recently. I just watched a terrifying documentary on the one-child policy in China. The folklore of early modern Europe, that was also filled with tales of parents taking the kids into the woods to get rid of them. Even in the modern day US, people will tell you that they will not have child number two or three because kids are expensive and kind of a burden, financially at least. Now flip that notion on its head as we head back to Sub-Saharan Africa. With the population so low, children would be an asset, not a burden. Obviously kids back then did not require a cell phone plan and a college fund and they did manual labor from an early age so the balance sheet was more positive. But most importantly, uh, when people were so few, children, they were the future. That also meant that women of childbearing age, they were also valued too. Not to the point of sharing political power with old men, mind you, but valued as potential bearers of children. And that dynamic shaped marriage practices in Africa. In many traditional African societies, women married very young, as soon as they hit puberty, say at the age of 12 or 13. Uh, life expectancy was low, children were few, so it was essential to get a head start with pregnancies by marrying off very young women. The men, however, tended to marry much older, maybe age 30. The reason was that women were so valuable that a dowry was expected. A groom had to pay money for the right to marry a woman and took many years to save enough cash uh, to become a groom. You're probably familiar with the concept of a dowry because it was fairly common in Europe and the US in the 19th century, for example. But in the West, it was paid by the family of the bride, basically because girls were considered a nuisance and you had to pay the groom to take your daughter off your hands. But in Africa, where childbearing women were viable, the man uh, had to pay for the privilege of getting married. So it was a male dowry. African dowry practices also meant that rich men had many wives, polygamy. If a man could afford the male dowry, he would take on another young bride and another and another. This was done for sexual gratification, of course, uh, but having many children by many women, that was also a sign of political power within the community. Remember, you cannot sit alone and be a chief. Well, you know, there are roughly as many men as women in a given society. So if you do the math, if rich older men had plenty of wives, that meant that there were not enough brides left for poor young men. And that was always a major source of conflict in traditional African societies, a tension between older men who monopolized political power, starting with access to young brides, and the many young men who were forced into celibacy, what we call an incel today, I guess. I've used some vague terms like rich and paying a dowry, and maybe you ask yourself, how did Africans measure wealth? And to whom did they pay that dowry? Great question. In our present day world, we often measure wealth through real estate. The American dream, that consists of buying a house, putting a fence around it, and hang out a sign that says, mine, get off my property. Well, that's because land is in limited supply, especially in a densely populated area like New York or California. Now, if you head back to pre-colonial Africa, the situation changes. With so much land for the taking, real estate costs very little. Putting a fence around an acre of land in the bush and calling it yours, that made little sense when there were 100,000 acres of empty land right next door. People would just shake their head and wonder, what are you thinking? Who cares about land? 
What was valuable, however, was people, because those were few. People were a source of wealth. Remember the proverb, you cannot sit alone and be a chief. There were also potential assets like gold dust or cowrie shells, but let's leave those aside to focus on what was more unique to Africa, i.e. people ownership. The rules might vary from region to region in Africa, but often there was a notion that a person in the community belonged to someone else. Maybe all the daughters in the marriage belonged to the bride's family, and all the boys belonged to the groom's family. Or maybe the paternal uncle had a one-third chair in his sister's kids, or what have you. Whatever the actual system was, a person had a financial value. And that's why it was so important for powerful elders to have so many young brides. Having 10 children, and that was like having 10 houses today. Now, the concept of owning people, that might seem odd. I mean, it's getting uncomfortably close to the notion of chattel slavery. So the question is, did this ownership of family members amount to slavery? Answering the question can be tricky for anthropologists. Let's say you meet people from the kingdom of Ndongo, and they describe various social classes in their community as the Kijiko, the Mobika, and the Kilamba. And then it's a judgment call as to whether that anthropologist should translate those words as slave, or serf, or servant, or employee, or draftee. And these terms can be tricky. When we studied feudal Europe, it took me a long time to explain to you what a serf was and how a serf was different from a slave in feudal France. So translating the word kijiko as slave or serf, that requires a lot of thought on the part of the anthropologist. Which leads to another more philosophical question. How would you define the term slavery in general? What makes a slave distinct from other social categories like a free person? It's more difficult than you think. We all have that mental image of an African slave toiling on a cotton or sugar plantation in Louisiana before the Civil War. But slave, that's a kind of term we use a lot with ever, without ever asking ourselves how to define it. And I'll let you pause the video for a minute and ponder that issue. Go ahead, come up with a good one sentence definition of slavery. Harder than it sounds, right? The way I like to proceed is by going through a variety of scenarios. Let's start with the case of a young woman, age 14, who is married by her parents to an older man, age 30. How do you call that? Is it slavery? Probably not. I uh, would use the term arranged marriage today. Or maybe pedophilia. Though weirdly, in many US states, such a marriage with an underage girl would be legal. Check that if you don't believe me. Scenario number two. A woman gets married to a man. In the process, cash is exchanged from the group to the family of the bride. Is this slavery? Again, I'd say no. I'd call that a dowry. Scenario number three. A young woman gets married to a man who already has three wives. Is it slavery? No, that's polygamy. Scenario number four. A woman is expected to have sex with another man, whether she wants to or not. Is this slavery? No, that's rape. Scenario number five. A woman is married to a man who expects her to raise the kids, do all the household chores, fetch water at the well, tend the family garden, and on and on and on. While he is in the palaver hut, chatting with his friends and playing dominoes. Is this slavery? No, that's just sexism. The husband is a chauvinistic pig, not a slave owner. Scenario number six, and I'm running out of fingers here. A husband beats up his wife whenever she doesn't do her chores to his satisfaction. Is this slavery? No, that's domestic violence. Scenario number seven, a woman does valuable work, like raising kids or tending a garden, and she does not get paid for it. Is this slavery? No, that's called unpaid household labor, or maybe even volunteer work. Now, let's combine all these scenarios into one. A girl of 13 is married by her parents to a man of 30, who already has three wives, but who's willing to pay good money to get another wife. That young wife, who never agreed to the marriage, she becomes the Cinderella of the family. All the household tasks are dumped on her. She doesn't get paid for any of those. And if she complains or if she refuses to have sex with her husband, she gets a beating. By the time all these factors are combined, you're starting to think, wait a minute, that poor woman is a domestic slave. So my definition of slavery is based on a bundle of factors. An exchange of cash, involuntary labor without pay, a threat of violence, and often sexual abuse as well. 
When all those factors are involved, you can conveniently translate a foreign African term as slave. So now back to Africa and whether the term slave can be applied to various social institutions there. Because the continent later became so involved in the Atlantic slave trade, the question of slavery within Africa has become highly political today. Some white supremacists that argue that the Atlantic slave trade wasn't particularly immoral because, well, Africans enslaved each other anyway. On the other side of the political spectrum, some people have refused to accept that any kind of slavery existed within Africa ever, for fear that this would take away from the inhumanity of the Atlantic slave trade. As historians, we're supposed to look only at the facts and forget about the political nature of our work. So looking at facts impersonally, uh, the vast majority of historians today agree that domestic slavery did exist with, within Africa before European slave traders showed up on the scene. It's just a historical fact. Which, by the way, does not take away from the fact that the Atlantic slave trade was deeply inhuman too. Uh, there were African slave owners who were complicit in the slave trade, and there were other Africans who were victimized by slavery. There were two main types of slavery within Africa. Uh, one could be described as internal slavery. It involved masters and slaves who belonged to the same kinship groups. And I just give you the example of a teenager who is sold to a neighbor and becomes a lesser wife of that family. That would qualify as an example of kinship slavery. It was also possible in Africa to be sentenced to slavery by a local court, either for an actual crime like murder or for something more nebulous like witchcraft. In that case, it would be easy for a local priest to accuse someone of witchcraft just to have an excuse to enslave that person. So that would be an ex another example of enslavement by a fellow kinsman. Loaning practices could all lead to slavery. In our society where real estate is king, we often use our house as collateral. If you borrow money from a bank, you'll take on a mortgage on your house, and the bank will repossess your house if you don't pay back your mortgage. You could, you could do that with a car, too, or you could leave a, a necklace at a pawn shop. In pre-colonial Africa, where land was abundant and cheap, people were a better collateral. If you wanted to borrow money from someone, it was easier to say, here is my niece, under local law, I have legal rights over her, but I need to borrow money from you so she will move to your house for the duration of the loan, and during that time, you can put her to work. Think of it as interest on the loan. And then, if for some reason I cannot repay the loan, keep my niece, she will be yours permanently. In this scenario, it was possible for a person to become permanently enslaved when the loan was not repaid. It's called pawn slavery. All of these types of slavery I just mentioned involve people from the same extended kinship, so there were limits to the amount of abuse that could be inflicted on the slaves. Uh, all those slaves spoke the same language as their masters, so they could speak up. Uh, they might have family members in the area who could vouch for them. And I don't want to romanticize slavery, but it was, comparatively, a more benign form of slavery than some other forms in history. Like external slavery, which was a second basic type in Africa, uh, which I'll cover now. And by external slavery, I mean being enslaved by someone outside your kinship group. Uh, let's say the kingdom of uh, Dahomey, present in Benin, waged war against its neighbor, the Alada kingdom. Prisoners of war from Alada could then be enslaved by Dahomey. Those Alada slaves came from a rival kingdom, they didn't have local relatives to defend them, maybe they didn't speak the same language, so they were far more likely to be treated harshly by their masters. Wars designed to obtain slaves were common in Africa, especially among warlike kingdoms like Dahomey. Remember that land was cheap, so conquering a province was not exactly a bonus. Capturing people from that province that was a real moneymaker. Either that or some low-level form of warfare like annual raids designed to, to kidnap people. That type of outside slavery based on war dramatically increased when European slave traders came to the coast of Africa uh, because selling slaves to Europeans, that became big business, which gave local elites, like the king of Dahomey, a greater incentive to start yet another war with a neighbor to secure foreign captives for export. We'll get back uh, to it later on when we study the Congo. Well, that's a lot of, to digest, so I want to stop here. Uh, but here's the main point I emphasize today. Africa is a vast continent where, until recently, people were relatively few due to difficult weather and disease conditions. As a result, one, cultural diversity was a norm. Two, animist religions often emphasized fertility goddesses. Three, political systems were often decentralized. And four, young women and children were desirable, which five, 
means that family ties often involve monetary considerations which could lead to social practices uh, that amounted to de facto slavery. Well, that's it for today. Next time we will be heading to the Kingdom of Mali, which also dabbled in slave trading, in part because of its contacts with North Africa, so that will allow us to study a different kind of African slavery, the one governed by Muslim law. Au revoir, see you next time. <laughs>